I recalculated the entire history of the Formula One World Championship with one small difference. What if you could only win it once? We had a week off from Formula One before Japan, so I got bored. And when I get bored, just like any normal person, I make Excel spreadsheets. I was thinking about a concept. In Formula 2, the highest feeder series before you reach Formula 1, you're only allowed to win the championship once. This makes sense. This is a series for up and coming young drivers. If you stayed in the championship and won it five times in a row, it doesn't really give a good opportunity for new young drivers to have a go. The theory in Formula 2 is the winner is then good enough for Formula 1 and they move up. In practice, uh, this doesn't always happen. But what if we apply the same principle to Formula 1, the ultimate anti-dominance rule? You're allowed to stay in the championship as long as you want, but if and when you win the championship, you have to leave. And I suppose move on to a real racing league, like Formula E. Now, before you leave your comments down below saying, um, actually, a Formula 2 champion can return to the series after they've taken two years away, I know. However, for this Formula 1 experiment, we're not doing that. You win it, you are barred for life. So, what does this do to the history of Formula 1? There's been 74 full championships, but only 34 champions. Obviously, in our experiment, we're going to have 74 different people win it. Who are they? Who wins each year? Do we get any rookie champions? It also raises some more unusual questions about the sport. Who has the most wins all time if drivers like Schumacher and Hamilton leave the sport early? Who, from the 2024 grid, has already been banned? And, by kicking loads of other drivers out, can Nico Hülkenberg finally get a podium? I can also confirm this has some strange effects on the history of the sport. At least one actual champion does not win their title in the system. We're also going to take a look at some of the new, most famous storylines throughout history. The way you do this is very simple. You take the actual results for each race, remove all the existing champions, and then redistribute the points to everyone who's left. Do that for an entire season and you can work out the new champion, of course using the point system from the time. Bear in mind though, to work out the 2023 champion, we have to work out the 2022 champion. And to work out the 2022 champion, we have to work out the 2021 champion. And to work out the 2021 champion, you have to work This out has some major effects for the Constructors Championship throughout Formula 1 history, but we are going to ignore that. In this scenario, once someone is banned, their seat is just going to be empty. Otherwise, I would need to re-simulate 74 years of driver transfers? I may be crazy, but that's a little too crazy even for me. Both Ferrari drivers are already banned from the sport. Oh well, no Ferraris on the grid then. Sorry. My name is Mr. V. Join me as we dive into a journey through a new history of the Formula One World Championship, starting in the 1950s. It's 1950 and Europe is ready to get back to racing. We are not doing that voice. <laughs> the Federación Internacional de l'Automobile has announced it will run a driver's championship for its new class of cars, Formula One. A few races have been run with these cars in previous years, but for this year, seven events have been chosen to comprise the first ever driver's championship season. I mean, if it's popular, maybe they'll make it an annual thing, who knows? The formula has just a few regulations. The car has to have four wheels, an engine of no more than 4.5 litres or 1.5 litres if it's supercharged, a firewall between the engine and the driver, and two rear view mirrors so they can see what's going on behind them. Oh, and also in the interest of competition, the FIA and the Drivers Association come to an agreement that the champion of each year will bow out to give other drivers a jolly good go at the thing. The very first season of Formula One unfolds, well, exactly as you'd expect. With no former champions to exclude, Giuseppe Nino Farina wins the first ever Drivers' Championship. He and Fangio win three races each, set three fastest laps each, but a fourth place in the Belgian Grand Prix pushes Farina to the top of the table. I should add, during the 1950s, the Indy 500 was part of the Formula 1 World Championship. It is there in these results I'm using, but it has no impact on any of the title battles. Or does it? No, it doesn't. Don't be silly. 1951. Farina is excluded, but this doesn't really change much. Ascari is closer in second in the championship, but Juan Manuel Fangio still wins it. So far, so normal. 1952, and again, not much changes. Alberto Ascari wins six races in a row, which means there's not really much stopping him. Three seasons, three familiar winners. 
This is where the fun begins though. 1953. In real life, this was won by Ascari back to back, but he's out. Our alternate reality sees Mike Hawthorne and Luigi Villaresi win three races each, but Hawthorne has a second to Villaresi's third, meaning he clinches the title. In real life, Mike Hawthorne would become the champion in 1958, but in this reality, he's gone and done it five years early. Good job, Mike. I should also add that through the 1950s, you did score one point for a fastest lap, same as today. However, we do not have statistics for every driver's fastest lap in every race, only the fastest lap of each race, which was basically always Ascari or Fangio. From 2019 onwards, we're fine, we've got the data. But back in the 50s, we just don't have the info to be able to award this point to someone who didn't actually set it. And so if a champion sets the fastest lap in one of these races, that point's just gonna have to be lost to history. If Villa Racy had set three fastest laps this season, which he may well have done, he would have been the champion. But sadly, we will never know. For 1954, the number of results that count towards a championship is increased to five. Jose Froelan Gonzalez says challenge accepted and drives to four outright wins, one shared win, and two and a quarter fastest laps. If you're wondering how that's possible, the British Grand Prix apparently had very inaccurate stopwatches. Gonzalez is our first champion who did not win it in real life, but he definitely will not be our last. In 1955, we again need to fill a void left by Fangio, and this time Sterling Moss steps up to the plate for 27 and one third points. Just as an aside, the points in the 1950s and 60s are an actual nightmare that haunt my dreams every time I make one of these videos. Those of you who have seen my ELO video will know that I have so much fun when drivers share cars back in the day. Lads, just drive one car, I beg of you, please. Sterling Moss was one of three drivers who drove in the P3 car at the 1955 Argentine Grand Prix. Not as bad, however, as Morris Trintignant, who drove in the P2 car and also drove the P1 car solo in this reality. How is that possible? I don't know, but apparently if you kick out Gonzalez and Farina, that's what the results say. <sighs> anyway, Sterling Moss is the 1955 champion. Considered one of the greatest of all time to not win the championship, this one feels deserved. 1956 and things are already starting to get a little bit silly with six banned drivers. The German Grand Prix this year only has three finishers, one by Jean Berra, who almost wins the title. He loses it, however, by two points to Peter Collins, who wins every single race that he finishes. The championship goes down to the last race in 1957, where Luigi Musso is leading Harry Schell by one point as we go into the Italian Grand Prix. 34 laps into the race, Harry Schell has an oil leak in his number four Maserati, forcing him to retire. Teammate Giorgio Scarlatti is told to pull over in his number eight Maserati to let Schell Shell drive. Shell then continues knowing he will only score half points. He almost clinches second, but finishes just behind Maston Gregory to take third and half of four points. Two laps behind, Tony Brooks overtakes Luigi Musso just before the line, but crucially, Musso still finishes fifth, earning him two points and staying one point ahead of Shell to win the championship. For 1958, the number of results counted towards the championship goes up to six. And also, you can no longer score points by sharing a car. Hallelujah. Tony Brooks wins three races, but poor reliability in the rest of the season hurts him. He retires in the Netherlands, France, Portugal, and Morocco. He even retires in Monaco after qualifying on pole. If he had finished just one more of these races, he probably would have been crowned champion, but instead he loses out to the much more reliable Harry Shell, who recovers from missing out on the championship the year before. In 1959, we end the decade with a familiar face. Jack Brabham does win the title with 32 points, and the first decade of Formula One comes to an end. 10 champions, some you recognize and some who may be a little bit newer to you. It's been an exciting decade. Let's see what the 60s have in store. The glamour of the 1960s is here and Formula One is spreading out to new locations and all new audiences. In the first season of the new decade, 22 year old Bruce McLaren says, close championship, no thank you, but in like a New Zealand accent. He demolishes the championship, scoring almost double the points of second place in his island, before heading off to start his own team so he can continue to dominate the sport even though he's banned. Found the loophole I see, Bruce. Fair play. 
1961 season brings a title decider that shakes the Formula One world. Heading into the Italian Grand Prix, Wolfgang von Trips is leading Ferrari teammate Phil Hill by nine points. Von Trips qualifies on pole, but then loses the lead on the first lap. On lap two, while battling to try and get back to the front, he collides with Jim Clark's car under braking, loses control, and his car then flips into the crowd. Von Trips is killed in the accident, along with 15 spectators. Phil Hill, unaware of the accident, continues driving to the win and therefore draws equal on points with his teammate. In response to the tragedy, Ferrari announces their withdrawal from the last round of the championship, therefore locking Von Trips and Hill equal on points on 37. However, with three wins to Hill's two, Von Trips is announced as the Formula One world champion, the first posthumous champion in the sport's history. Sadly, he will not be the last. In 1962, a different Hill, Graham Hill, no relation, does something crazy. He finishes every race in a season. I know, wild. Only the second driver to ever do so up until this point, this helps him sail to an easy championship, just like in real life. 1963, and Jim Clark is fed up of letting other people win. He almost wins nine in a row, but settles for seven wins and two P2s. Only six results counted towards your season points, so this is exactly the same as real life. 54 points for Clark. Pretty hard to beat. 1964, and John Surtees wins the championship like real life. With Jim Clark and Graham Hill out of the picture, this is a one-sided affair. Ginther, Bandini and Gurney are the next best drivers, but they are a long way behind. I would imagine one of them was probably expecting to win the title in 1965 with Surtees gone too, and so they definitely weren't expecting Formula One's first ever rookie champion. Jackie Stewart. His entire F1 career therefore comprises just one season, where he finished second second, first first, second first, DNF, first, DNF, DNF. Absolute mad lad. He doesn't get nine seasons and three championships like real life, but Stewart does still go down as an F1 legend. Stewart would remain a permanent fixture in the Formula One paddock, a prominent member of the Grand Prix Drivers Association and a vocal advocate for safety in the sport. 1966 is once again suffering from low numbers of cars in the sport. The Monaco Grand Prix this year only has two classified finishers. Bandini wins it with Bob Bundurant classified in second, five laps down. Obviously, this should have been Jack Brabham's third title, but with him out of the way, this leaves the door open for up-and-coming Austrian driver Jochen Rint to win his title four years earlier than real life. In real life, Rint would sadly go on to become Formula One's only posthumous champion. But in this timeline, I suppose he wouldn't have been in the 1970 Italian Grand Prix, and so wouldn't have had his accident. It's not something I want to speculate on too much, but I am going to say he's not the only driver who avoids a tragic accident in this system. More on that at the end. 1967 goes similarly to real life, except this time Denny Hume wins eight races on his way to an absolutely monstrous 76 points. 1968 sees the widespread introduction of aerodynamic wings to the sport, nine winners in 12 races, and Belgium's Jackie Ix on the podium six times on his way to the driver's title. 1969 is again plagued by low numbers of cars. The Spanish Grand Prix only has one classified finisher. Congrats to Jean-Pierre Beltoise, I suppose. The German Grand Prix this year is actually won by a Formula 2 car. Zero Formula 1 cars actually cross the line in this race. Two are classified, but both of them retired two laps before the end, with one of them being Jean-Pierre Beltoise again in second place. Picking up these points on a technicality helped Beltoise pick up the title from Joe Sifford, ending the 1960s on a bit of a down season. But all is not lost. Several promising rookies coming up through the junior formulas promised to make the start of the 1970s a lot more exciting. A new decade sees new rookies Ronnie Peterson, Emerson Fittipaldi, Clay Regazzoni, among others, joining the sport. In 1970, Clay Regazzoni doesn't even take part until the fifth round in the Netherlands, but in his eight races in the sport, he wins six to become the second ever rookie Formula One champion. I should note that Regazzoni also won the Formula Two championship this year, making this one of the most monumental seasons by a driver in motorsport history. 
1971, now second year driver Ronnie Peterson wins his title from Francois Sever and Emerson Fittipaldi. The Super Swede is again considered one of the greatest of all time not to win a title. This one feels correct. 1972, and with other rookie hotshots out the way, Emerson Fittipaldi absolutely dominates this season. A six win streak to equal Ascari's record with two other wins to boot, and this one is in the bag, much the same as real life. In 1973, Francois Sever clearly liked the example set by Fittipaldi the year before, and he decides he's going to win eight races too. However, the season finale, which should have been one of triumph for Sever, about to retire with the highest win tally ever in Formula 1 history, was marred by tragedy. Sever had already wrapped up the championship two rounds earlier, but was still pushing hard in qualifying at the United States Grand Prix at Watkins Glen. He came off the track just after turn three, hit the barrier, and was killed instantly. Mathematically impossible to catch, Sever becomes the second posthumous Formula 1 champion in this timeline. 1974 sees a title battle for the first time in a while in the sport between Jody Schechter and Nicky Lauda. However, an exciting start to the season with these two trading wins kind of fizzles out, as Schechter DNFs the last two races and Lauda DNFs the last five. It turns out that does not help your championship chances, and so Schechter is the 1974 champion. 1975 is less close, with Nicky Lauda proving why he is the favourite of this year, winning comfortably, just like real life. 1976 is a title battle not between Hunt and Lauda, but Hunt and Depayer. Patrick Depayer actually starts the season stronger with four wins in the first half, but can't win any more after the Swedish Grand Prix. This allows Hunt to catch up and crucially overtake him for the title. The film Rush is still made about these two, but in this timeline it's a bit lacklustre. The 1977 finale in Japan sees Mario Andretti trailing championship leader Carlos Reutemann by five points going into the race. Andretti qualifies on pole and Reutemann can only achieve P5. If they finish the race like this, Mario Andretti will overtake him to become the world champion. However, on the first lap, Andretti gets a bad start and is dropped down the field. On lap two, while trying to fight his way back to the front, he collides with Binder and Takahara, takes himself out of the race, and crucially, out of any hope for the title. Congratulations to Carlos Reutemann. 1978 is revenge time, and this time, Mario Andretti wins it comfortably. Eight wins over the season. He clinches the title in Italy with two rounds to go, and so treats the North American leg of the season at the end as a sort of home crowd victory lap, one of the most popular drivers of the 1970s. In 1979, with OK form at the start of the season and riding on the high of his legendary battle at the French Grand Prix, Gilles Villeneuve would have a strong end to the season to catch up and overtake Jacques Lafitte for the title. Another highly popular non-champion from real life, Gilles Villeneuve ends the 1970s F1 champion and leaves a lasting impression with his son Jacques. Maybe he'll get into racing too, who knows? It's 1980 and it's all change. Fashion is going crazy, music is going crazy, and Formula 1 isn't sleeping either. This season sees the debut of some names you might recognise. Nigel Mansell, Alan Prost, also, Williams has decided to be fast now and take Australia's Alan Jones to the title much like real life. Third year driver Nelson Piquet puts up a fight with three wins and seven total podiums, but ultimately falls short when he DNFs the last two races. 1981, and you may have thought that Nelson Piquet wins this title after falling short the year before, but with Villeneuve and Reutemann now out of the picture, Jacques Lafitte wins five to clinch the title by one point in the finale in Las Vegas. Will Nelson Piquet become another real life champion who misses out in this system? He won three in real life, so he's got a few more chances. Let's wait and see. 1982 plays out similarly to real life with Keke Rosberg becoming the champion after only two career wins, a feat achieved by Shell, Brabham and Ix before him, but becoming a lot harder to do now in the 1980s with more races. 1983, all right, Nelson Piquet round two, can he do it? The title battle is close between Prost and Piquet, and they go into the final round in South Africa with Prost ahead by five points. Halfway through the race, Prost retires with a turbo failure, and so Nelson Piquet only needs to finish P2 to win enough points to win the title. He finishes P3, and crucially one point behind Alain Prost for the driver's title. 
In 1984, despite only winning the opening round, a long string of podiums take Elio De Angelis to the driver's title over Michele Alboreto. Nelson Piquet wins three, but DNFs nine races, which severely hurt his chances. 1985, and last year's runner-up Michele Alboreto wins the title with five P1s. Second place in the championship? Some Brazilian kid called Ayrton Senna. Who the hell is that? 1986, and once again, Nelson Piquet is involved in a hotly contested title battle, this time with Williams teammate Nigel Mansell. A battle of two titans. This one goes down to the final round. Before the last race in Australia, PK has 5 wins, 76 points. Mansell has 5 wins, 77 points. Will PK lose out again? Mansell qualifies P1, with PK P2. However, on the opening lap, PK overtakes Mansell to take the lead, with Mansell dropping down to third. The pair would continue to battle for the lead for 64 laps, a nail-biting race, until disaster strikes for the Brit. Nigel Mansell's rear left tyre blows out spectacularly, taking him out of the race and allowing PK to cruise home for the championship, the only car on the lead lap of this race. After nine seasons in the sport and three runner-up performances, Nelson Piquet is finally crowned the F1 Drivers' Champion. 1987 sees Mansell return and try and win the title he lost to a tyre blowout the year before, this time against another Brazilian, Ayrton Senna. Senna is ahead by two points going into Japan, where Mansell crashes in qualifying, sustaining injuries that will see him sit out the last two races of the season. This obviously hands a title to Senna, who wins in likely the third fastest car on the grid. The 1988 season is famous in our timeline for the dominance of the McLaren MP4-4 at the hands of Prost and Senna, but in this timeline, they're both already banned. Despite being quick in the hands of Nigel Mansell, the 1988 Williams was hurt by new engine regulations and would only finish two races. Mansell wins them both. This was obviously not enough to recontest the title, which was instead fought between Ferrari's Gerhard Berger and Benetton's Thierry Boutsen. Berger would go on to win the championship in what will come to be regarded as one of the least exciting F1 seasons all decade, marred, of course, by a slump on the technical side. For 1989, Nigel Mansell jumps to Ferrari and is involved in the title fight again, this way a four-way battle between him, Patrese, Nanini and Bootson. Mansell would win every race he finishes this season, but 9 DNFs hurts him and in the final race of the season he is jumped in points by Riccardo Patrese and his old team Williams. It's got a sting, doesn't it? With some of the most exciting races in the sport's history and a few drivers considered the fastest to ever do it, Formula 1's popularity soars through the 1980s, helped on by the storylines of PK's title hopes blending seamlessly into the continued heartbreak of Nigel Mansell. Can he win it in the 90s? And who else will be added to our growing list of champions? Find out in part 2.